morning. I'm Rita Smith and this is Kaylin. This morning we're reading from John 11, 45 through 57, the plot to kill Jesus. Therefore, many of the Jews who had come to visit Mary and had seen what Je Jesus did believed in him. But some of them went to the Pharisees and told them what Jesus had done. Then the chief priests and the Pharisees called a meeting of the Sanhedrin. What are we accomplishing, they asked. Here is this man performing many signs. If we let him go on like this, everyone will believe in him. And then the Romans will come and take away both our temple and our nation. Then one of them named Caiaphas, who was high priest that year, spoke up, You know nothing at all. You do not realize that it is better for you that one man die for the people than the whole nation perish. He did not say this on his own, but as high priest that year, he prophesied that Jesus would die for the Jewish, Jewish nation, and not only for that nation, but also for the scattered children of God, to bring them together and make them one. So from that day on, they plotted to take his life. Therefore, Jesus no longer moved about publicly among the people of Judea. Instead, he withdrew to a region near the wilderness, to a village called Ephraim where he stayed with his disciples. When it was almost time for the Jewish Passover, many went up from the country to Jerusalem for their ceremonial cleansing before the Passover. They kept looking for Jesus, and as they stood in the temple courts, they asked one another, What do you think? Isn't he coming to the festival at all? But the chief priests and the Pharisees had given orders that anyone who found out where Jesus was she reported so that they might arrest him. Have a blessed day. Thank you. We have been studying from the Gospel of John this several weeks with Pastor Jason. And really, today's passage is a continuation of the first half of chapter 11. Um, as Pastor Jason said, it's part two of Lazarus. Again, we see here in this passage today a great contrast going on, people who believe and people who see the exact same miracle and still not believe. At the same time, there's a great irony going on here in this chapter as we're going to explore that we're going to see. And we begin today's passage with the verse 45. It says here, therefore, many of the Jews who have come to visit Mary has seen what Jesus did and many of them believe. So who are these people that come to believe in the miracle of Jesus? Well, these are the families, friends, and relatives who came to console and support Martha and Mary uh, four days ago. And now after it has been four days, they're still there consoling, supporting, and crying and weeping with Mary and Martha. And some of them, many of them actually, it says here in verse 45, believed, but some of them don't. And actually, some of them ends up going to the Pharisees and telling them about it. From the verse, we do not know what their intention is. Just to tell them, hey, a great miracle happened. You wouldn't believe it. A dead man, four days in the tomb, was raised from the dead. Or, did you know what happened? A title telling. We don't know. But the Pharisees take this report very seriously. Up until now, we have seen them throughout the Gospel of John in the face of Jesus, debating with him, talking with him, fighting with him, calling him names. And now they're bringing in the high priest and the Sanhedrin, which is the ruling Jewish council, the highest legislative judicial body. Even though the Romans were in control, they gave a little autonomy to the Jewish people. So they let them decide their matters of religion and faith through the Sanhedrin. So they call in this meeting. And looking at verse 49, we could tell that this is an informal meeting because it says here, one of them, and Caiaphas, speaks up. Because if you are a formal meeting, as a high priest, Caiaphas would have presided in the meeting. I know that FCF has council meeting every third Tuesday, and I was happy to attend last month. But if something happens, such an emergency, they call in, hey, we have to get together, something came up. And I think something's happening here. 
Jesus is at it again, and this time he made big trouble. Let's get together. And when they call this meeting too, they're saying this in, in verse 48. What they're saying, like, what have we done to let this thing continue with Jesus? For me, that's kind of, doesn't make sense because they have seen, well, they have heard about the greatest miracle, a dead man who was rotten and, and, and stunk, as Martha said, coming back to life. And now they call this informal meeting, emergency meeting, not to beat their chest and say, what have we done? We didn't see this before. This man is truly the son of God. It's contrary to that. They're like, what have we done to let this thing continue? What happens if, they, if he continues what he was doing before and everyone ends up believing in him? What would happen? And then the next reason surprises me even further. Then the Romans will come and take away our temple and our nation. Does that make sense to you? Doesn't make sense to me. But maybe what they're saying is right on the surface because a bigger crowds gathered together with Jesus and following him as their king, Romans would now look at them and smile, right? They were like, what is going on? People gathering? You know, the tension is going on there. Maybe they already know that this is happening. As if biggest crowd gather, Romans might send the soldiers to quelch an insurrection. In the past, there have been cases where soldiers were sent into quelch an insurrection, and, and the results were not pleasant. It was gruesome. It was grim. It was devastating for the survivors as if to make a lesson of people, like, don't you dare rise back against Romans, right? So that could be a reason, and it makes sense. But I think something is going on here. And this little possessive plural, possessive pronoun, our, here, in verse 48, it says here, our temple, our nation, that's a little clue to understanding what is going on. I think what they're saying is that our place, our comfort, our way of doing things, our status quo, I think that's what they're referring at. Because high priests would have a political influence. And a regular Israelite will break their backs, paying taxes to Rome, to Caesar, and also to the family of King Herod, and also to the temple, as in temple tax, and that will make a lot easier for the hyper. So, so this system actually benefited them. So they wanted to continue the system. And as we can see here, John points out that Caiaphas is a high priest of the year two. Um, normally, this position of a high priest is for a lifetime. But under the Roman occupations, the governors which would summon the work in their favor. And when they're down there, they pull stuff. It's kind of interesting because here they are, they're trying to maintain their place, but it's very all temporary. And as we read on, Caiaphas will be deposed of later after Pilate's term as a governor. Is that all there straight for the reason? I think there's a bigger reason. The spiritual reason. You see, when all these people believe in Jesus and they all go to Jesus, rather to them, they lose their place spiritually, their honor and prestige in trying to be the go-between between God and these masses of Israelites. That's what they're getting at. They don't want to lose that place. Because when Jesus raised Lazarus from the death, he shattered every convention. He redefined a new relationship with God, a son of God himself. So the Sanhedrin had a good reason, not for the sake of people, but for themselves, to keep the status quo. And Caiaphas says in verse 49, very arrogantly, you know nothing at all. It is better for one man to die than for the whole nation to perish. Indeed, it's a great solution, a grand plan. Maybe he patted himself on the back. That's a great plan, Caiaphas. You thought of it. These people here didn't think of that. 
Let Jesus die in our place so we can continue the system of comfort, the status quo, this way of doing things. Let his death save us. Jesus in our place. Having a comfort zone and trying to maintain the system of status quo in the first century is not something new, as long as we're human beings and we're sinful. And it continues to today, the 21st century. When we have a system that we're comfortable, we just want to keep it up. And when there are challenges, we want to push back at it. While I was thinking about this passage, I remember a story I shared with Sunday school kids years ago. And I thought that, oh, that's a great story to share with with all of you today. Once upon a time, there was an old clock that went tick, tock, tick, tock, tick, tock, very slowly and very sadly, 24-7, all day, all night, all the time. And when the hour rung, the clock seemed to say, oh, let's be sad, let's be sad. The old hour has gone, let's be sad. And it went tick-tock, tick-tock, very slowly and ever so sadly. And one day, a new clock moved into the same room. And it went And when it struck an hour, it seemed to say, let us rejoice and be glad the new hour has come. How awesome, the new hour. Imagine how the old clock took this. Not very happy, not even one bit. It said, are you really a clock? You're all the time. That really annoys me. You don't sound like a grand old clock. You sound more like an egg beater than a clock. And then the new clock replied, Hey, this is the way I tick. I tick, I tick, I tick, I tick, I tick. And what does it matter? I tell the right time, right? But then the old clock said, No, 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 no. Clocks are not supposed to tick that way. They're supposed to go tick, tock, tick, tock. And my way is the best way. So you better listen. And so on and on, this Two clocks kept arguing, and I don't know how it ended, but I can leave that to your imagination. It might be a cute, funny, and we can say, oh, it's just a cute story, but I think it has application for us here too, because how many of us like to keep the things the way they are? We're very comfortable, and when things happen to shake it, we're like pushing it back. We're resistant to it. And we are aware that oh, I, should, I should change, I should let this up and do something more challenging, but we don't have the courage. And we just end up being in our place, in our place of comfort, rather than place of growth and place of change. Going back to Caiaphas' plan, His plan could really work. Jesus in place of the Sanhedrin. Jesus in their place. And it's a great plan at one level. It's a great politically expedient plan. But the greatest irony happens here from verses 49 to 51. There is a double meaning going on here. They are the human words of Caiaphas at one level. Sure, they'll resolve the problem of Jesus once and for all. That is true, beyond a doubt. But on another level, God is the one who is in total control. He's the sovereign Lord. It has been his plan of salvation all along. God did not just come up and say, oh, Caiaphas say that? It is a high priest? Wow, that sounds like a great plan. I want to join in the bandwagon and go from there. No way. It has been God's plan of salvation from the beginning of time, throughout the history of mankind. In the Old Testament, God chose Abraham. 
eventually his descendants. And when they failed to be the light and salt in the world to show you who God is, God had this plan all along. Caiaphas, just an instrument. Remember how God has used Cyrus of Persia to bring the exiles home to the promised land to Jerusalem? Instrument. God is using Caiaphas' words. Gave him the words to speak. At the human level, in verse 50, Caiaphas only mentions the one man would die so that the nation of Israel would not perish. But guess what? John adds an explanation and includes all the people scattered all over the world that believe in Jesus Christ. It is not a simply gathering of all the Jews, definitely Jews, but it's gathering of everyone inclusive who believe in Jesus Christ. And Jesus is the agent of that gathering. Indeed, God's plan is huge, humongous. It's out of this world. This includes everybody all over the world. Jesus would die for all their sins for the people of the world, not by ethnicity, but by faith in Jesus Christ. As we read on, in verse 53, they have the audacity to pass on the death sentence to Jesus. What an irony. These religious leaders are passing death sentence to someone who is the resurrection and the life, who has power over death. Someone who just raised Lazarus was four days old in the tomb. They're passing a death sentence upon him. But this worked only toward God's plan of salvation. It is to enhance God's power over life. It could not stop it. And what Jesus gives us exceeds all hopes and expectations because his gift of life redefines the power of death. They're nothing impotent before our Lord God. Jesus is indeed the resurrection and the life. Death has no hold on him, nothing. And in verse 54, as we continue the passage in John 11, we see Jesus no longer fully moving about. Was it because he was scared? No way. He's in total control. He decides when and where he's going to die. It's all part of God's plan. to die for all his people all around the world as the ultimate sacrificial lamb. Throughout the John, we've been learning that in chapter 8, Jesus was telling the, uh, the Jews, at my death, you know that, him, that I am he, the son of God. And we're learning from chapter 10, the good shepherds lay down his life. Indeed, Jesus' death is the dividing line between those who believe and those who don't. It is either or. There's no one in between. And nobody hinders God's plan of salvation because when Jesus dies, the seeds of life are waiting to spring up in the lives of people who believe in him. Whatever happens, God uses for his purpose in his grand plan, not Caiaphas, God's grand plan. If we read in Acts 15, 36 and following, we read about Paul and Barnabas as they are preparing to to begin their second missionary journey. But things are not going great because they're going back and forth about someone named John Mark. And as we, if you read further, you know that during the first missionary journey, John Mark just abandoned them. 
And so Paul was like, oh, you know what? That guy did that the first time. He would do it again. He has made a precedence. He would do it again. And Barnabas says, let's give this guy a chance. And they went back and forth. And what is the resolution? They went their separate ways. Barnabas takes um, John Mark through Cyprus and on. And Paul takes Silas and goes the opposite direction. And God still uses this to advance his work of salvation. And what about Mark? Well, I guess this had been traumatic for him. Maybe he grew as a result because in the end, Peter, Apostle Peter, praises him saying, my son. And he goes on to write Gospel of Mark. And also, as we read on, Paul also reconciles with Mark and says, Mark, you're with useful in ministry. You're doing good. So all is good. So God has been using all this. And for Paul, because he went the opposite way, he get to meet Timothy and raise his arm as a great leader to look after one of the churches during his missionary journeys. And God even uses a disagreement for his purpose. Isn't that the same for us? If you look back into our lives and, and we reach into memory, hmm, yeah, there's some time in my, in my life where I did this, and God has to use it for, for that purpose. Wow, hallelujah. Um, maybe if you look back, you would remember the words you have uttered to these people who came to church the first time. They were like really nervous and uncomfortable, and you came and spoke to them nicely and quietly and warmly. And later they came up to you and said, because of your words, you forgot all about that, but because of your words, I came to to Jesus. And what about our acts of kindness we do toward the shadows around um, in our street corner, this lady who couldn't drive, uh, eating her grocery and stuff. When we look back in time, years later, we see that how God has used all of this for, for his great work. And we don't always make the greatest choices, right? There are times when we had bad choices, made mistakes. And sure, we suffer consequences from it, but that made us stronger, even resilient. And God uses all of that too. Nobody hinders God's acts of salvation, his plan of salvation. He uses all of them. He sent his son, Jesus Christ, to die in our place. His son to take you in our place of death. I don't want to use this graphic term, but he kills his son for us. Me for Jesus, us, our place, our place for Jesus. It's like a judge sentencing this man to a life sentence. And afterwards, he comes down the steps, takes off his robe and says, I'm going to take this man's place. This man is free to go. Something like that, but even more grander than that. Jesus taking our place and suffering and dying so that we can live and stand before our God in full righteousness. Are we ready to listen to the voice of our shepherd who lays down his life for us? Are we ready to be obedient to him and to follow him today? It is my prayer that to the Spirit's guidance and leading, that we'll be able to listen to the voice of our great shepherd who lays down his life for us so that we may live. Amen. Let us pray.